my parents met Robeson, but didn't know him in that sense, but they had admired him through his work for whatever years and years and years. And, um, and they met him when he came to the progressive daycare that I was a toddler in, which is how come we have the picture of me as a toddler autographed by Paul Robeson when I was whatever, eight months old or something like that. Um, but they admired what he did in the world. They admired his philosophy. As far as, as, far as Robeson as a, a black um, icon and, and a man of incredible heart and soul, that must have played some part in my going to Mississippi. What actually triggered my going to Mississippi was sitting in Toronto at home in the summer of 1964, watching the horrible news unfold of the three civil rights workers, Cheney, Goodman, and Schwerner, who were, went missing and had been executed by the Klan with the involvement of the deputy sheriff and with the involvement of at least one highway patrolman. And I remember watching that story unfold over 64 days until they found the bodies. Um, and I was horrified. And that was the trigger of why the next summer I volunteered with SNCC and went down to Washington where I did 10 days of training with Stokely Carmichael in nonviolence, in how to do voter registration and, and the importance of, of facing violence with nonviolence. Uh, when I was down there, uh, I spent my first 10 days. The night I arrived, there was a rally in a, in a church in the black section of town. Uh, James Foreman spoke, and, uh, and um, I think Bob Moses was there. And it was, it, was a, it was a rally because there were demonstrations going on each day to try and get a, a series of laws repealed that were racist laws. So the next morning, I joined the orderly demonstration, silent, walking in twos to go to the federal courthouse, the courthouse, the federal attorney. And we got two blocks and we were all arrested, thrown into big cage trucks and carted off. Uh, so I spent my first 10 days in Mississippi in jail. Uh, and and then I was posted to Greenwood, which is uh, in some ways the heart of darkness. Greenwood was, was where um, the, the, um, some of the most racist events took place. I mean, it, they did everywhere, but Greenwood was one of those tough centers. So I was stationed there. In the course of that, um, I heard a truck going around town one day saying, White Citizens Council meeting, everyone welcome, everyone welcome. So in my naivete, I wanted to understand, because this is me, I wanted to understand like, so how do college educated men and women believe in such forms of racism and violence? The White Citizens Council, we called the white collar Klan because that was kind of, and, so I put on a shirt and tie, thinking that would protect me. No one will recognize me in a small town. Duh. And um, I went to the county courthouse to go to this meeting. And in the course of walking up the front walk, I was stopped. And, and uh, a guy who turned out to be Delay de Lebec with Junior um, punched me in the head. He got one punch in. But Fortunately, I was an athlete and I managed to outrun him and his three friends or I could have been serious trouble. And um, so what happened was that I did my voter registration work. Um, I took delay to court, charged with assault. He got off and we probably knew he would get off. But I felt that if I didn't do that, it's an invitation for him to punch the next person in the head because there's no comeuppance, there's no justice. Um, the FBI came to me after this, after, the, after I filed the charges and said, are you out of your effing mind? <laughs> That's what they said. That was the words of the FBI. <laughs> and uh, they, they said, well, if you're going to go through with this, we suggest you leave town until the trial which I did, and I did work elsewhere in Mississippi before coming back for the trial. And, uh, and um, 
so what happened was in terms of the prom film, um, years later in uh, about 2007, 2006, I got a phone call from a newspaper man in Jackson, Mississippi, who had read my name in the records of the Mississippi Sovereignty Commission that had just been unsealed. And he called me and I said, what's the Mississippi Sovereignty Commission? And he said, exactly. <laughs> and that was his response. He said, the Mississippi Sovereignty Commission was the secret CIA of the governor. Uh, and your name's mentioned in it. And so that led to me being curious to go back. I hadn't been curious to go back. So I went back to Mississippi for a week just to see what had changed and what hadn't. And in the course of that, I met Morgan Freeman. And the, and the way that happened was, interview said that as a quote, as a black man, he felt safer in the South than in the North. And I thought, I wonder what that's about. And at the same time, in the same period, I read in the New York Times that more Blacks were moving South than North for the first time in American history. And I wondered, what's that about? So I got in touch with Morgan and I said, can we have a half an hour cup of coffee? And he said, sure. Uh, you know, I said I'd been a civil rights worker stationed in Greenwood in the 60s and I'm just coming back to see how things have changed and not changed. And... Um, a half an hour coffee turned into nine hours sitting together and talking. Um, and that inspired me to start making a film that was meant to be called Return to Mississippi. And it was meant to be how has Mississippi changed and not changed through the eyes of an ex-civil rights worker going back. And the reason I inserted myself in the concept was I literally thought if somebody told me there was a documentary on about how Mississippi had changed and not changed, I wouldn't watch it. Sounds boring. But maybe if there's someone to guide you through that journey with a personal tale to tell. Um, so that film never got made and it never got made. I shot, I shot 60 hours of material. And, but near the end of shooting that, I learned that Morgan Freeman's hometown Charleston, Mississippi, 2,300 people. One high school integrated in 1970. Does, didn't have proms, but the town had a black prom and a white prom put on by the parents. <clears throat> and the reason that happened was, number one, the school didn't want to get into it. They didn't want to hold an integrated prom. The school board was, um, in a certain sense, reactionary. So the black parents put on a black prom. You could always go to the black prom if you were white. And some white kids did, not many because of the backlash from the white part of the community. And the white prom, which the white parents put on where blacks were not allowed to get in, even if you bought a ticket and gave it to your best black friend and, and, and some kids tried this. And you know the black boy who tried it was told to get lost or he'd be in trouble. So. You couldn't go to the white prom if you were black, but you could go to the black prom if you were white. And I thought that that was remarkable that there were two proms and Morgan Freeman had offered to pay for the whole prom if they'd integrate it 10 years before I was there. And when I learned all this, I called Morgan up and I said, is this right that you've offered to pay for the whole prom but no one accepted it? And he said, yes, that was 10 years ago. And I said, is the offer still good? And there was this pause on the end of the phone. And he said, oh, OK. And I said, well, if you'll put the offer back on the table, I'll come back and film this whole process. Because I think that film about young people and whether the prom gets integrated or not, it's a story of people's desires and feelings and the mores of the town. I said, I think young people will be way more interested in that film than in the film I've just finished shooting, which is less cogent. So that happened. I went back and, and lived in the community for four months because I didn't want to fly in and fly out the way those things can often be done. I wanted to live in the community. I wanted to film in the school, which I did every day for four months. And I filmed in the community really every day for four months, culminating in the prom. So that became prom night in Mississippi. A, an aside is that Morgan 
said to me when he first saw the finished film and I was with him, he said, uh, we should get this to Obama in the White House. I said, do you know him? He said, oh yes, we're friends. So it got sent to Obama and one of Obama's people called me up and invited me to do a screening at the White House and a, an audience discussion on Moving Beyond Prejudice, which is my nonprofit is called Moving Beyond Prejudice. And it's the work I do with people, including police forces, if I get a chance. And um, it's amazing how easy it is to actually move beyond prejudice. It is amazing. Now that sounds naive, but no one moves beyond their prejudices by being told they ought to, or they should, or it's high-minded. People move beyond their own prejudice when they gain by doing that. And it's very easy to do that kind of um, teaching work where what you're really doing is saying, the reason not to be prejudiced is not to, because of me and not because you're told to, the reason not to be prejudiced is if you're prejudiced against blacks or Jews or whites or women or men, you miss so many great people that can enhance your life. So the reason not to be prejudiced and to be open to others is it enriches your own life. That's the, that's the reason to do it. And that people get that, they get that, they just resist. You should be not be prejudiced because it's, you know, because the Bible says, or your teacher says, or your parent says, you know, that just tends to meet resistance. So yes, yeah, so the 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 prom film we screened it at the White House with uh, an audience of 150 people. Um, I brought the kids up from Mississippi and one of the fathers and had them sit in the back row after the lights went down so no one would be distracted by, oh, that kid, someone's, you know, in the room. And at the end of the film, uh, all the kids came up on stage for a, a discussion about moving beyond prejudice and the audience gave them a standing ovation as they came down to the stage. It was like, whew, wonderful. And one of the most wonderful things that's happened in my filmmaking life and I apologize in advance, this is a self-serving story, uh, which I tend to try to stay away from. So I'm dealing with one of uh, Obama's, per well, with his personal assistant, Reggie Love. He was the one who was the liaison for arranging everything. And he was not only Obama's assistant working his butt off, but he was also doing his MBA at Wharton. So we would end up having conversations at three in the morning when he was riding the train back to the White House or riding the train down to Wharton. And one, one of these conversations was just mind blowing. And it was, it was really very precious to me. He said to me, so let me get this straight. You're Canadian, you're not American. I said, yes. And you weren't living in the States or going to school in the States in the 60s, no. And you drove down to Washington and then to Mississippi on your own and joined up the civil rights movement, yes. And he said, well, on behalf of the American government, I'd like to thank you. <laughs> you know, what a beautiful moment, what a beautiful thing that Reggie could have said was that. So that was a very precious moment for me. 